to prime the other hosts on, on, we'll be talking more about the corporate side as opposed to the consumer business. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. All right. So we'll go silent and uh, have fun, everybody. Good, Matt. That's great. Good boy. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome to the Hirschberg Entrepreneurship Institute's webinar series, Yes We Can, Perspectives and Strategies for Success in 2021. We will begin the webinar in about four minutes. Hi, everybody. We'll be starting in about two minutes. Thank you for joining us. We'll be starting in about one minute. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us at the Hertzberg Entrepreneurship Institute's webinar series, Yes We Can, Perspectives and Strategies for Success in 2021. Today we're presenting brands launching in the current market with Nicole Dawes and Matt McLean. Before we get started, we just want to give you a little bit of guide about how we're going to be using our webinar format. We will be using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to ask a question of our panelists, please put it in the Q&A. Just click on that button. This window will pop up. Type your question on the bottom and hit send. You can keep the chat window open. However, we'd like you to reserve that for just chatting with other people or if you have any technical issues, please use the chat. But if you have questions for our panelists, use the Q&A. And now 
Gary has an announcement for a new opportunity. Well, welcome back everybody. Uh, glad you're here and I'm very excited about today's session. We've got two, a couple of really fun entrepreneurs and a great co-moderator as well. Um, but as Carlene said, we're going to uh, do something a little uh, different to start today. Um, if you have a service or product that you would like to offer to the HEI community, we're inviting companies to uh, apply to give a five minute pitch at the beginning of each of our webinars, which by the way, we will be scheduling into uh, April. We've got a couple more to add to the schedule this week. Um, remember our mission here is to really enhance your business. And that can mean helping you grow your sales by being one of the people pitching. But conversely, for those of you who are uh, with us today, we've got about 120 folks so far. Um, you know, others uh, who have been with us the last few weeks might have a service or a product that can enhance your, your option, your opportunities, uh, gifts uh, for your employees, gifts for your customers, uh, enhancements, spiffs, this kind of thing. So um, Carlene, if you put, put up a little slide here for a second, um, if you have, uh, we're going to uh, uh, use, we have a guinea pig right now, a wonderful young entrepreneur from San Francisco I'm going to introduce in one second. But if um, you have a pitch, a, pr a product, a cur uh, Carly, that slide isn't there yet. Um, if you have a product, if you have a service, and uh, you'd like to uh, apply to offer it to the HI community, uh, instructions, if we don't have it now, we'll put it up at the end. Uh, instructions will be uh, on our website for how you do that. If you get them in to us by uh, Friday, uh, prior to, or rather, I'm sorry, Monday morning, uh, Friday, uh, that here it is, uh, prior to the following week, uh, we will let you know by Monday morning if you've been selected to give the five minute pitch. So you can get more details at our, um, at our website. So with that, I'm gonna introduce uh, our first uh, presenter here, a young entrepreneur who's actually been an HEI uh, presenter in the past, he's uh, had a case uh, Luke Bergevin um, uh, 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 with Foot of the Bed uh, Vineyards in um, San Francisco. Uh, and Luke is going to, uh, he has a proposition for all uh, uh, companies, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, participants in the um, HEI community. So with that, Luke, I'll let you explain your opportunity. It's all yours. Sounds good. Thank you, Gary. Um, am I coming through? Great. Good. Uh, I'm Luke. I am uh, based in San Francisco. I've been running Foot of the Bed Cellars since 2016. We've got a healthy consumer wine club where we are going out and selling um, two new wines each month from small production West Coast producers. We're buying finished wine, uh, getting it in bottle ourselves, and selling under kind of a transparent private label. Uh, through the years, we found ourselves more and more uh, getting asked to come on site at different companies around the Bay Area. Most of my network is in San Francisco. And so uh, saw a real opportunity to do on-site wine tastings, um, sort of in lieu of taking a team up to Sonoma and the expense and day that that entails. And so we had a lot of success doing that as the world uh, started to shut down now about a year ago. Um, we had started doing a little bit of this corporate private label work, and we saw the category really jump for us last year. Um, we've got folks who use it for any number of things, client gifting, new hire welcome kits. Uh, we do sales kickoff quota club. Uh, we have people use it to try to bring back churn prospects. Um, we will do companies virtual happy hours. We have been asked, you know, whatever you might have a need for, uh, we are finding a lot of success with this service. Again, we work with small production West Coast wineries. We've um, been doing it since 2016 and uh, have sold 110 wines from 85 different producers. So um, really proud of the quality that we're able to provide uh, and also the price that we're able to do it at. Uh, Carlene, if you could cue the next slide. A um, few details on sort of how something like this would work if you were interested in working on us. Uh, it's a two case minimum per SKU. So if you wanted to send a bottle of rosé and a bottle of Pinot Noir, uh, that would be a four case order. 
uh, for single bottle packages, we, we, because we're doing the fulfillment on our end, we ship to 39 states within the continental US. Um, most places that you would presumably like to send this wine, we are okay to send to. There are some states that are still uh, quite restrictive when it comes to alcohol and we don't wanna poke the bear in that, in that uh, regard. So two case minimum per SKU on private label projects. Uh, generally a three to four week lead time is needed. If you are someone who would like to buy 2000 bottles of wine, uh, that lead time might be a little longer, but I would be very happy to talk to you as soon as this is over. Um, but that gives us uh, you know, what we have in inventory to put together your label. We have a wonderful designer that um, her services are included. Uh, for a lot of folks, uh, they like to let their internal design team take on uh, the project. Um, and then we can include a custom hang tag that will be attached to the bottle uh, or any other piece of collateral that uh, you might want to include as a note. Um, we've got a nice testimonial here from Brianna at Tonkin, who is hosting her probably 10th virtual tasting with us tomorrow. Um, if you could click the next slide, please. Uh, so this is Chris. Chris is my sommelier and, and wine director. He has been a SOM in the city for 10 or 15 years, worked at a lot of really high-end restaurants. He owns a great shop in the dog patch called Ungrafted with his wife, Rebecca, who is one of the only female master psalms in the US. Um, and for folks who would, would like to get something going with us, uh, if you would like to pair it with a virtual tasting led by Chris, um, we will include that complement as part of your larger order. Um, there's a link on the right here if you'd like to uh, fill out an inquiry or you can send me an email directly. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity, Gary. If there's any immediate questions, I've still got about 54 seconds. Well, I want you to show one, of, show a couple of the private labels that you've done just so people sure. understand you can put your logo on a bottle. So um, this is one we did. Um, here we had big contracts with LinkedIn's internal uh, third-party caterer before. Uh, this was a company called Eden that's based here in San Francisco. So uh, the process is very easy. We've got high quality wines um, ready to go that would retail for well above what we're able to sell them for. Um, and I think the, the personalization touch is really nice. Um, being able to, to add an event piece to it um, kind of enhances it beyond just simply getting a gift. So um, Super. happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Gary. That's great, Luke. Thank you. So there you go, folks. Uh, if you want to uh, offer an unusual spiff of a high-end wine at a low price uh, for your employees, for others, uh, support a emerging entrepreneur and uh, have a little bit of fun at the same time, Luke's your guy. And again, if you're interested in uh, making your pitch, your service, your product, uh, let us know. We'll be uh, happy to uh, uh, try to get as many as we can uh, into our program. So look, uh, let's turn to today. Um, you know, many as you have followed the trajectory of the last uh, five or so weeks, we've heard from retailers, we've heard from e-com, we've heard from um, distributors, uh, we've talked about capital efficiency, we've talked about um, just planning and thinking. What we haven't really done is we haven't drilled in with entrepreneurs, uh, business people who are actually launching during this very crazy time. And we have two fabulous presenters today, really three with, when you add Ethan, all three are in different uh, sectors. Um, Nicole Dawes, who I think probably needs no introduction. Uh, Nicole and uh, her family were the founders and creators of Late July Organic. Um, uh, Nicole and Peter, uh, uh, over my uh, objections and uh, counsel, uh, went ahead after they sold Late July and did it all over again. Uh, and it's a fabulous brand. If you haven't seen, tried, or tasted uh, Nixie, uh, get, get, on the, get on the wagon here. Um, Nick, Nicole is just a natural entrepreneur, grew up in the food business. Uh, her dad was actually an old uh, friend of mine. Uh, and. Uh, uh, started uh, Cape Cod Chips. So Nicole literally grew up uh, in the business and has uh, really had a legendary run. But what is notable for today's purposes 
is that uh, they were really just kicking off, getting into gear when COVID hit. And I think that's gonna make for some unique storytelling, which we'll hear from in a moment. And then we have uh, Matt McLean, uh, who's the CEO and founder of Uncle Matt's Organic. Again, probably needs no introduction. Uh, what you may not know about Uncle Matt's is that um, uh, besides being an organic ag activist uh, and, and entrepreneur in organic farming and so forth, he started this literally, uh, he's a seventh generation Floridian. He started this Uncle Matt's literally in three acres in his father's backyard. Uh, but Matt and Susan and family grew the company, sold it to Dean Foods, uh, what, I think six years ago, Matt, I've lost track now. 2017. Uh, okay. And uh, then uh, Dean went and bellied up, went bankrupt. And uh, Matt called me about, uh, oh, I don't know, <laughs> a month or so after, uh, said, guess what? There's an auction. I'm thinking about buying this company back. So we put an investment group together and now uh, Mac is back in the juice. Um, I, I have the honor of being on his board and again, uh, had a uh, launch that was coincidental with COVID hitting, literally taking over the keys uh, just as, as uh, everything was locking down. And so uh, Matt's gonna kick us off, but before uh, he does so, let me also introduce Ethan, um, who I think, again, <laughs> probably needs no interest since I, I pitch his shots uh, whoa, at every, uh, every opportunity. But Ethan uh, is um, uh, someone who also, like Nicole and like Matt, grew up uh, in the business. Uh, literally, Ethan was born at Stonyfield Farm and is undergoing uh, his own uh, revolution, which he might talk a little bit about with his business right now. And, and, Nicole, and uh, Ethan will be helping me to moderate. So with that, Matt, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, Gary. I will share the screen. Get into the right format. There we go. Hopefully and just a reminder while Matt's lining up, uh, use the Q&A. Ethan and I will be monitoring your questions. Thanks. Yeah, great. So yeah, thanks, Gary, for the intro and the invite today. I'm excited to be here. And uh, thank you, New Hope, for sponsoring this. I get a lot of great feedback from people who attend these. You know, I hope what you take away from today is just some good practical advice, some things that you, uh, to do and then what not to do as a young startup entrepreneur or a experienced company uh, out there. So a little bit of history about us and some uh, more about our products, and then we'll get into kind of Uncle Matt's 2.0 and probably more relevant to a lot of what you're doing today as a startup company or an early stage company. But we are, I'm a fourth generation Florida citrus grower. It's in my blood. Um, my great grandfather moved here in the late 1800s. He farmed citrus, uh, passed that love down to my granddad who passed it down to my dad who passed it down to myself. I grew up in the citrus groves. We we're just west of Orlando, a little town called Claremont. It was a primarily agriculture town, 60s, 70s and 80s. And then we had devastating freezes. Uh, in 83, 85, and 89 that changed the dynamic and became a commuter city for Disney World in Orlando. But that's me on the tractor there sitting on the seat. I've got my sister and brother next to me. I did just about everything you could imagine in an orange grove growing up. Um, I was uh, proud to be out there and we ran a crew and did all kinds of different things. But I went off to college to actually get out of agriculture. I said, you know, there's got to be a better way. Uh, it's a little too hot and maybe I can get on the business side of this. And so I graduated a degree in 1993 of business administration. When I got out, I was lucky to borrow a small sum of money from my parents and start my own import export company. So I set up shop, had a folding table for my desk. I began faxing like crazy, uh, everybody around the country. That was before emails, uh, which is kind of funny. And, um, looking to sell ag commodities and I, I got lucky with a German businessman and we became partners and he was selling uh, to different bottlers in Germany and throughout Europe and so I would go around Florida and find the conventional juice from the different processing plants and we would ship it over and sell it. And so I cut my teeth on what makes a good quality juice for three or four years selling to a bunch of different uh, countries and a bunch of different customers until I came across one gentleman in south of Bavaria in southern Germany and he asked for biologic uh, grapefruit juice and I said you know I'm not sure exactly what that is it translates to organic. I came back to the U.S. 
I looked around the market. There obviously was no organic juice at that time, uh, no Tropicana or Simply. And so that was the aha entrepreneur moment. Like, okay, I think there's a, an opportunity. I had no idea about distribution and marketing and sales and all those things. Uh, but I knew that there was, if it was a great tasting product and it was, uh, there was demand over in Europe that potentially it could be in the US. I went to my grandfather who was still alive and also my father and I asked them, um, you know, as growers, can we grow organic in Florida? I'm gonna need supply and a base. <clears throat> and my granddad was basically offended. And he just said, hey, you know, I was alive before pesticides were invented in the forties. And we grew organically, nobody called it organic. Uh, we used fish emulsion and compost and all kinds of uh, cover crops and great stuff like that. And he was at a point in his life where he really felt that from an agriculture standpoint, we should go back to those methods. Uh, we were tied up on single factor analysis with if you have a pest, you immediately find a pesticide. If you have a fungus, you find a fungicide. And organic's more holistic and it would take you back to farming the soil first and growing a healthy soil that would yield a healthy tree and ultimately healthy fruit uh, for us. And so he sold me on the capabilities and off I went, uh, young and dumb at the ripe age of 27. In June of 1999, I launched that one SKU. That's me with a hairnet there to the left uh, with our cartons, the first production run. I had uh, pulp-free orange juice, that was it. Sold it locally to Gooding supermarkets and a bunch of natural food stores in Florida and the Southeast. I got my big break in 2001, actually on 9-11. Uh, Publix, the buyer called me after two years of knocking on that door. He called me literally on 9-11. I'd watched the first tower fall. I was in shock and he said, hey, man, I'm going to give you some really good news on a really bad day. I'm like, wow. Okay, you're right. Thank you. Uh, but one of those days you never forget. And then later, uh, a couple of years later, I got Kroger, a couple of years after that, Whole Foods and became a national footprint, and national distribution. And kind of the rest is history. From there, we built uh, scale and momentum and became the number one selling organic OG and grapefruit juice brand in the US. And then we took some private equity, a minority investor, Greenmont Capital out of Boulder. Mark Retzloff, the founder of Horizon, joined my board and uh, Todd Willison, the founder of Izzy Soda. Fantastic people, uh, mission aligned. And after five years in 2017, it was time to exit uh, and get them uh, either replaced uh, and find another group. And so when we went to the market Lo and behold, we realized that uh, it was a good time. Uh, we thought about it, prayed about it, and said, hey, you know, this is a good time for our family to exit. And uh, Dean Foods, America's largest dairy in North America, they were publicly traded on NASDAQ, $8 billion company, 17,000 employees, 6,000 uh, DSD trucks up and down the road every day, uh, 60 different plants across, strategically placed across the U.S. Uh, they came in and bought us, and it was a a good moment for us in time. I stayed on with my wife to run the company, uh, reported directly to the CEO for a good stint of that. Uh, flew out to Dallas regularly to talk to the leadership team. I was part of the top 40 uh, in the leadership group to kind of really help uh, with feedback to the company. Unfortunately, they came on hard times. The dairy business is really tough, very low margins, and they had 60 plants and unfortunately were not able to move quick enough to change in dynamics of plant-based and some other uh, dynamics around private label. And they uh, filed bankruptcy. And so got the opportunity, which you'd never think. Uh, first lesson, when you sell something once, you may get a chance to buy it back. Uh, so don't completely part with it. I had emotionally kind of moved on from that point and thought, all right, I'll put it in good hands. This is a company that could really take it everywhere and be ubiquitous because milk is everywhere. Uh, but then we got it back. And, I called up Gary about 30 days prior to the bid and said, hey, I, I got a real short deadline and I need some really good people. Uh, and Gary was all in and that was uh, fantastic. He's you know, always been a mentor of mine in the industry, uh, dating back many years. And I knew we were aligned uh, on the same mission around organic and good, healthy food. And so that was step one. And then uh, fortunate enough to get Nicole on board as well with her family. Um, and you know, had a lot of great times with her and the Organic Trade Association board fighting for organic and the farm bill and for marketing initiatives, et cetera. So great time. Um, and here we are today, Uncle Matt's 2.0. We got it back April 1st is when we officially uh, won the bid and closed on the, on the deal. It was a crazy wild time. I had a 
uh, several different uh, attorneys that helped me through the process. I had to have a bankruptcy attorney because of the massive bankruptcy that Dean Foods was. Uh, we had to have a deal attorney to help put the whole deal together with Gary and the investors. And so I was simultaneously, as the world was collapsing around me, I was in this office right here. Nobody else was in our office because of COVID. And I was, you know, dialing for dollars, you know, hey, <laughs> I got this uh, crazy opportunity and uh, I know you're probably not interested in doing anything but surviving right now, but I really think it's you know worth the time. Could you please call me back? <laughs> um, and Gary was you know nice enough to call me back. And so here we are today, but <clears throat> our product's pretty simple, flavor first. I'm fanatical about flavor. Uh, it must taste great. We, uh, you know, I've got a saying, we have to be consistently great every day. And so no matter what job we have that you do at Uncle Matt's, you need to be consistently great every day. So what are those small things that you can do uh, to be that uh, consistently great performer? Um, we are, our juice is certified organic. Of course, it's uh, in our, ingrained in our uh, DNA. We also went the next step. We were the first juice company in North America to be glyphosate residue free, uh, certified by the Detox Project not from concentrated juice. Uh, we don't use any flavor packets. That's one kind of little hidden thing. Orange juice companies are allowed to use flavor packets and not have to put it on the label uh, because of a ruling in 1960s around uh, if it was derived from an orange, uh, they felt it didn't need to be placed on the label. So we don't use it. We give you what mother nature gives us. Um, it's gluten-free and kosher. So big bottles, our biggest seller is the top left, pulp-free orange juice. Then we have some other innovation uh, that we'll talk about here in a minute. We are America's number one selling organic OJ brand. Uh, we have a 30% uh, category share. Uh, when you look at the orange juice category overall, it took a, the last decade's been tough on orange juice. Uh, organic's been the one shining star that continues to grow every year. But the conventional has been demonized by sugar and orange juice is no added sugar, but it's still had a lot of people that uh, took it out of the, its diet. And so the pandemic came, uh, people started turning over and reading labels again and vitamin C, uh, lo and behold, orange juice is nutrient dense. Uh, like we knew all along, it's packed with vitamins and minerals. It's got a great 100% of the daily uh, value of vitamin C. Uh, and it's cost effective when you look at it and it's a great uh, portable uh, product to put in your body and, and on the go. And our organic customer, 38% uh, estimated are millennials, 23 are Gen X and the boomers uh, proud. We're still in their 33% the boomers category. Um, Gary, you're pulling the wagon for us. Innovation, a little bit of fun that we had when we bought back Uncle Matt's from Dean Foods. Um, you know, Dean, they let us, uh, you know, have reins and do what we wanted to do with the company, but it had to go through their process and systems. And so the first thing was to be more nimble. When you have 60 plants and uh, 6,000 trucks and 17,000 employees, it takes a while to make sure it can go through and flow through the entire system. So we launched Ultimate Immune in four months after we bought back Uncle Matt's. And it was right during the pandemic, we said, hey, we wanna do a supercharged OJ uh, on a functionality piece. We took elderberry, it's natural high antioxidant properties uh, known for its cold and flu uh, protection and immune support. It's a beautiful purple juice. I've got a, now my favorite product. Uh, kids love it, uh, blends well. We also boosted the vitamin C. So we used acerol and ascorbic. So you get three versions of vitamin C, the 300C, 50D and 25 zinc. Um, and stuff like this is just fun when you get a company back and you can be uh, nimble in the beginning. Uh, so excited about that. So now how does this really um, relate to you? You know, this is Uncle Matt's 2.0. This is how we reset the company and uh, the challenges that we'll face on a bunch of different levels. Uh, and it's pretty much kind of like a startup on steroids. Right out of the gate, you got a new company. So this was an asset purchase out of bankruptcy. It was in a, wasn't a stock deal. If it was a stock deal, you could keep the same company, the same federal ID, uh, and you wouldn't have to change that. And, you, and at first you think, okay, well, that's that's fine. And then, but if you do an asset deal, you got to change the whole company. So you got to get a new tax ID. So that triggers uh, for every single customer that we currently have with Uncle Matt's through Dean Foods, we had to get all new paperwork set up. So Unify, you know, and we're just seen as a brand new company, but we were 20 years old. Uh, Publix, Kroger, just go down the list. Every single company we had to do uh, new paperwork with 
We had a skeleton staff in the beginning. We hadn't rehired anybody. Dean had most of the finance and operations uh, and sales force. So I was a, a strong team of about five. And we had to quickly hire 10 people, director of finance, director of sales, uh, all kinds of uh, ops people. But the, the key piece is cash is king. Payment delays, you know, 90 to 120 days. So you needed to be really cognizant of that. Luckily we were and had some foresight, but um, it takes a long time for people to get sorted out in their system, a simple vendor change, a new uh, item number. And we had to go on good faith. We didn't want to out of stock and pull our product off. So we had to ship in hopes that they would be paying us and eventually getting those uh, uh, vendor numbers set up. We also uh, had all kinds of billing errors, people you know, billing us for pre-bankruptcy uh, bankruptcy stuff from promotions to scans to all kinds of different things that you had to con constantly fight uh, when you did get uh, correctly paid uh, about you know, old billing errors. We had upset vendors, obviously we were still working with a lot of the same people for bottle cap, label, outer case. Uh, and so those were delicate times and tough times because these are people that uh, a lot of them I've had for relationships for a long time. And, and integrity was strong for us as a seventh generation Floridian, fourth generation in the Florida citrus business. You know, that means a lot to us. And so, you know, this was something that we didn't cause, uh, but we were trying to at least tell them, hey, with a new company, you got a chance to earn it back because uh, we'll continue to do business and we're set up to grow. Um, new investors and board, that's the other thing. Uh, we were very fortunate to have great investors who have deep experience that we can tap into. I really enjoy those calls uh, that I have with Nicole uh, and other people. We have John Forker's on our board, uh, Andrew Abraham's on our board from Borgain and uh, Once Upon a Farm Annie's. Um, and of course, Gary uh, and Bob Burke. So we, we've got a dynamite team. But then what is the proper reporting for them? What is their uh, cadence, you know, are they uh, finance uh, heavy? Or are they marketing heavy? You know, what really are they goal specific? And do you align on mission? Luckily for us, um, we align on all those things. Our previous investors at Greenmont were the same way. We, we had big problems with citrus greening disease and drastically changed our model in Florida from being our, our own sole supplier to then having to go outside of the state. Um, we, we, grew everything uh, up until 2014. But Greenmont said, hey, instead of working out of this arrangement, we're going to work through it with you. Um, and that's when you really know when you get in a foxhole with somebody and we have problems, that's when you know, are you mission aligned uh, and do you have the right investors? And so if you can do some reference checks in the beginning, you know, it's always great. Hey, somebody wants to give me money and, and get involved. But if you don't really know them, do some reference checks and find the ones that, uh, if you can, that failed. And why did it fail and what happened? Um, that would really be helpful. The other thing, new employees, we had to reset our culture to some extent because we had a whole lot of new people come in. We had to get ownership buy-in. You know, you always want um, employees to act like owners, not necessarily just like employees. And so we had stock options that we granted. Uh, we've got a bonus plan that includes everybody around setting goals on company goals and also personal goals. And so we have I feel a really good culture, really good buy-in on what we're trying to accomplish. And we're all in the same boat together. Uh, we have Monday morning powwows with the entire staff just talking about, are we reaching our goals and are we um, heading in the right direction? We talked about innovation, but it's really nice to be nimble, better for you beverage company, uh, focusing on function. That's kind of where the consumer is taking us. Uh, who knows, it may circle back uh, to be uh, less functional, but right now, you know, what else can you do uh, in a beverage like orange juice that can get in front of consumers and be a nice, easy uh, dynamic? And then marketing, you know, PR focus, really do more public relations with the buyback. That's a great story. We got a lot of uh, press around that. So if you have any angle as a company that's fun and different, uh, people are dying for content, right? Um, also, uh, we focused on our new innovation. Uh, we've got highly engaged social media trying to get, you know, content creation. You're really building a digital media company, not just a marketing PR company, but really a digital media company. And how do you do that? Um, and last, uh, new sales. I was fortunate enough to rehire my old director of sales, um, which is great. He, he was here for six years of the, the biggest growth we ever had in our company. He left right before we sold to Dean Foods for another opportunity. 
Uh, but it was great to get him back and he hit the ground running and we didn't miss a beat. We captured a lot of those accounts that Dean Foods had through their DSD network that we needed to move over to uh, direct into warehouse. Uh, we had to rehire a broker network on the national scale. Dean had a uh, quite a convoluted conventional broker uh, system. Uh, we kept uh, our yin and yang and presence folks. Uh, they do a great job for us. Uh, and then focused on new avenues, club, food service, uh, convenience, and then really dial in ACV. Uh, look at your ACV, look at share growth, and look at velocity to make sure you don't have a dog out there. You don't want to launch a new item and realize after the fact, when it comes to the review time, that they were actually too high in shrink and they were throwing a lot of stuff away. So, you know, ask about velocity metrics from your buyer and then set goals around it um, with your sales team and your marketing team uh, to be diligent um, and really try and drive it home. So, that's where I'm at today. I appreciate the time, energy, and uh, Gary, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, we have some questions coming in and we will come to them. Uh, I think it's important before Nicole uh, goes here that we underscore uh, for the discussion to come that um, Matt had a national sales force uh, with a set of different objectives than we now have, than Matt now has. Uh, they put him into some places he probably shouldn't have been. Um, they created some uh, challenges that uh, were not of his making. And uh, <laughs> I think we'll get into some of the weeds on some of that and how you extricate, how you undo. Uh, uh, and uh, I also just need to quickly say, because Nicole is such a great storyteller, also, remember last week's session, everybody, on storytelling. Uh, you know, Matt drove this home with a couple of key points here that, um, you know, uh, being cash conserving, getting suddenly hit with these uh, debates over payable receivables and, and pressure on vendors and so forth, uh, it cut into the cash available, right? So what do you do when you don't have cash? You've got to go to storytelling. You've got to tell your story. And again, fortunately, in both these cases, we've got some great stories. So um, Nicole, I think we'll just have uh, you take it from here and then we'll uh, throw this open to discussion. I just want to remind everybody, please put your questions into the Q&A um, and uh, Ethan and I will keep an eye on them and get them out to you. So um, to the panelists, I mean, um, so Nicole, welcome. Hello, thank you, Gary, for um, inviting me and also for putting these together. I mean, it, I think one of the questions I get probably the most from like new entrepreneurs or people starting businesses is, you know, where can I get advice and how can I get all my questions answered? <laughs> and these um, webinars are so incredibly useful. I mean, you cover just about every possible topic that could be important to entrepreneurs. So, I mean, just it's, um, you know, for the people who are participating today, you know, great. And if you, you know, make sure you go back and listen to all the other ones if you, if you haven't. Um, so I don't have um, a long presentation, but what I was planning to do was to use, and Carleen, I don't know if you're, are you going to put up the one slide I have or should I do it? Yeah, she can do that. Okay. So what I was planning to do was to just, because I, I think that what the most um, interesting thing that I have to offer to the people here today is what's happened this past year. Um, and so I was gonna very briefly touch on um, late July, just so that you can you know, know who I am and what, where I, my framework coming into this pandemic and launching a new brand. But um, you know, I was gonna focus mostly on the last um, 12 months. So um, Nicole Dawes and I started late July snacks um, while I was pregnant actually in 2002. And we hit shelves in 2003 and then um, like a million things went wrong and some really, really wrong <laughs> and some, some really, really, really wrong. Um, and then through, uh, I would say about seven years of making all of those mistakes um, and then uh, ultimately resulting in our bank calling our pretty large equipment loan uh, due to the death of my father because we had a death of a member clause in our loan agreement. Um, that was really the low point where I thought our entire business that we built would pretty much be over. 
but we came out of the ashes of that event. And um, honestly, we were sort of an overnight success that took us seven years to get there after that moment. And we kept growing and growing and growing uh, until, you know, we went from about 8 million in sales around then and, and in just a few years after past 100 million and then uh, keep growing. And we eventually sold to Campbell's um, in 2018. And I have to say that, you know, I, like Matt, I actually was involved with when my father bought back a brand that he had sold, um, Cape Cod Potato Chips. And so I know, I mean, it's very emotional when you sell a brand. I, I actually never thought I would sell HLI. I mean, it's like a child, you feel very attached to it. Um, but I'm very proud of how it's doing with Campbell's. It's growing, it's, um, you know, they really care about the brand. And so it does give me a lot of pride to see what's happened since I've left. Although there are that, you know, seeing that Matt's, Matt's back, definitely, you know, it, it brings up all those feelings and emotions, but Lachel is doing great with Campbell's and, and it's very exciting. But as Gary mentioned, um, we completely disregarded his advice to, to not start a new company. And my husband and I dove literally immediately back in after selling late July and started Nixie Sparkling Water. And since I didn't know anything about the sparkling water category or manufacturing, I spent, you know, pretty, I almost a full year kind of figuring that part of the business out and just, you know, how do you buy cans and, um, you know, what are the rules around um, canning and, and uh, just, you know, I had to learn that whole, that whole business. The one thing that was very similar to snacks is the way it sold. So luckily for me, that whole side of the sparkling water business was very, very similar. So I launched Nixie Sparkling Water. We took a, about a year to get the uh, products ready for distribution. And kind of before I get into that, one of the things that I wanna mention that is sort of the anchor of everything I've ever done is um, my companies have always been built around three pillars. And the reason why it's important for me to have those very defined pillars is because when things go wrong, like our bank calling our loan or um, a global pandemic, <laughs> you know, you need to really call on, you know, what makes your brand, like, why did you start this? Why is it important to you? And, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? And for me, those three pillars are the people on our team and the community that we serve. So that is um, you know, making it a, a great place to work, giving back to our community, having a charity component in everything we do, um, offering, you know, good wages and livable wages, and um, also, you know, making sure that people can live their lives the way they need to in terms of flexible work hours. I mean, we already let people work from home when they needed to. Um, the second pillar that is very, very important to me is um, the quality and attributes. And that's where I kind of bucket organic. I mean, we've always been certified organic. It's, it's, it's absolutely one of the most important things that, you know, why I start brands. You know, one of the reasons I launch in popular categories is because I feel like if you can make a organic product number one in a category, you can really, you know, change the supermarket. And, um, you know, I saw that happen in snacks with, with Lake July and, you know, I think that, you know, organic is sort of the, the anchor of our decisions, but there's so much more, you know, in that. And, and, you know, it's like, what kind of package do we use? You know, one of the things I love about being in sparkling water is that it's, you know, we don't have to use plastic bottles. <laughs> Sorry, not on that one, but, um, you know, it's fully recyclable. Um, you know, we can, they can be, we can use BPA free liners, um, you know, testing our water for um, PFAs, I mean, there, there's so much that goes that, that I love and feel good about with this product line um, that kind of fits that second bucket around quality and organic. Um, and then the third is taste. And obviously Matt talked about that, but you know, I think especially if you're in the organic industry, it's sort of like, you're gonna let the rest of us down if you don't care about this third pillar because you know, I think the way one organic product tastes unfortunately affects the whole category. You know, if you come out with a bad taste of your organic product, you're just sort of reinforcing, I think, that idea that organic products, you know, taste like um, my mother had a health food store in the 70s, which is sort of my 
formative years. And I have, you know, a lot of feelings about the way the products in her 1970s health food store tasted. And, you know, I've worked really hard my entire career to innovate and make organic products taste absolutely delicious so that when people buy it, they fall in love with it as a product. And then they sort of back into, oh my gosh, it's organic. And oh, I also can do this. And oh, it gives back to charity. And it, oh, it does all these things. So those are the three kind of pillars of, of who I am and who every company that, you know, from Late July to Nixie. And so I think what, why I mentioned that is because I'm about to get into what happened after we launched Nixie. So we hit shelves in December of 2019. Um, and as we're rolling out, we're very excited. Um, you know, obviously we had just a couple of months with actual revenue when March rolled around. And while there was a lot of, um, you know, I think that it, it was, you know, consumer products and obviously food was a big part of what was growing during um, the early days, especially of the, um, the quarantines and, and shutdown because people need to eat. But the brands that were being most affected by that were challenger brands and particularly brands that did not have the track record. Um, you know, we didn't have real velocity uh, track records with these retailers or distributors, so they didn't know how to keep us in stock. And they were prioritizing, um, you know, the brands that were the number one or number two in the category. So, it, it, you know, I mean, things didn't fall off a cliff in March, but they, they really almost fell off a cliff in March. And so that's what I wanted to focus on today was kind of what we did and why I think that, you know, for any startup brands or anyone that is looking at growing a company, um, COVID or not, but particularly when you're in uncertain times, whether it's, you know, what kind of a tragedy you're facing or what kind of a problem, is the most important thing that you can do is really understand your sales, your velocity. And, and it's not very interesting and it's not, you know, Gary is talking about what a fabulous storyteller I am. And now I'm going to sit here and tell you how important data is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the, the fact is that it is, it's mission critical for you to understand your data, which is so hard when you're a startup company with no money. Um, I mean, believe me, I resisted, you know, buying data or spending any money on that for years at late July. Um, but there are things you can do if you, you know, even if you don't buy data. And so when we set up Nixie, I made sure that we had excellent like that are, and none of this was expensive. So, you know, like the way, like our back end of this company is, it's, it's excellent. And, you know, I would say that it's as good as after, you know, 15 years at late July and we had much fancier stuff, but I think what we're doing at Nixie is equally good and um, allows really good visibility into what's happening with the company. Um, yeah, there's just simple things like, you know, this is an important for understanding your data but making sure that your company is set up in a way that you're not wasting time on the, the, the unimportant things like, you know, HR software. Um, you know, everything we do is in the cloud, you, you know, whether it's Gusto for HR, Bill.com for our bills, um, Zero for our accounting. But when it comes to, and then, but when it comes to the actual data side, we use um, this software called Crisp, which I don't know if anyone else is familiar with, but it helps with your forecasting, which is, about the most important thing that you can do to keep your products on the shelf. Um, making sure that you have accurate forecasts because you're never going to be able to convince your distributors to order more if you can't provide evidence as to why they should. Mm -hmm. And what we were finding in the early days and particularly through summer for Nixie was that we, our velocity was, um, you know, was a lot higher than what the distributors and the retailers had predicted. And so the absolute worst thing that can happen to you as a new brand or a challenger brand is that you, you, know, you have an empty spot. I mean, it used to drive me crazy and be like, oh, congratulations, you know, your product was sold out at the store. And it's like, I mean, that's like knife to the heart, you know, it's like, oh, great, it was sold out. That's great, thanks for telling me. Um, but so what, you know, we, we have this, I mean, I'm happy to talk to anybody that wants real details on, you know, this side of it, but, I mean, we have 
you know, very, very detailed spreadsheets working where we like cross-reference what CRISP is telling us versus what we think it should be. And we kind of meet in the middle in terms of what our uh, forecasts are. And then we do subscribe to UNFI's Clearview, which I know there's a lot of controversy about that, but I mean, if you really want to know what your product's doing, I mean, it's, it's one of the easiest ways to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so the combination of all of those things is how we've, we've kept our products on the shelf throughout, um, you know, not in the first couple of months because that was impossible. But, you know, once we were able to, to kind of show this data case for ourselves and why people needed to order. And the fact is that we could supply and some people couldn't. So when, pe when other people were running out or when people weren't willing to go the extra mile to, you know, ship something uh, expedited because a grocery store was sold out of, um, you know, sparkling water, which is a shelf stable important item when people are trying to stock up on things. Um, you know, we would go that extra mile and we knew we had it in stock. We knew we were capable of shipping it. Um, so that that's, I think that, you know, I guess I wanna like leave enough time for questions, but just helping people understand that, you know, a lot of what it takes to survive in times like this is not the like, you know, really fun, you know, we actually put off PR we put off a lot of stuff this year because, you know, we have a really small team and we needed to focus on serving our, our distributors and our retailers. Like we put all eight of our team on, you know, one mission and that was keeping our products on shelf and making sure our shipments arrived on time. And I think that's why, you know, when I look back over this year, we had, um, you know, we had, we started the year with just a couple of customers. We ended the year in over 5,000 stores and in all 50 states. Um, we're the fastest growing um, sparkling water of, you know, like brands that have, um, you, know, like a, you know, like enough sales of it. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, I think that it was not because of anything that's particularly glamorous. It was just a lot of really specific legwork. That got us there. That's great. Well, uh, can I jump in here? So, because yeah, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of questions coming in for both of you guys. So obviously, I'm trying to kind of consolidate, but I'm just curious if if we can focus on you for a second, Nicole. What about innovation on your guys' side? Because I think throughout these webinars, everyone's saying the same thing. Uh, they're having problems with retail sell-ins. So it, it the conversation always goes to the same two things, which is one innovation and two is D to C or, or Amazon. And there's a bunch of questions in here about D to C. So I think we'll get to that, but obviously you guys have both sold your companies before. And so you've seen the other side of it, Matt bought his back and immediately they went into pretty substantial innovation as a growth factor. So, and, and that's where they're leaning into with ultimate immune, et cetera. So I'm just curious how you guys thought about that during this period or if you just focused on on data 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 and selling the products you have well honestly we we were in it. our entire company was an in innovation you know we just yeah. launched and so and you know retailers are taking a pretty big gamble on us to to give us shelf space i mean they were counting on the fact that you know we know how to execute at retail and that we were going to support these launches so you know i was very hesitant i mean we have innovation like in our pipeline ready to go but I was very hesitant to come back and particularly all the shows are canceled, you know, and I'm trying to be sensitive. I mean, I, you know, I have a, a family member that's running two infra stores and I mean, I don't think she's slept in, you know, 12 months. And, you know, it's like, I, I, I'm trying to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, these retailers took a big risk on us this year and I didn't feel great about coming back and like trying to get them to take our new innovation. So we decided, to hold off on innovation until um, like now, actually, we're going to be, we're going out with innovation for this summer. Yeah. And I felt like that was a theme when we did the webinars at last spring and you were on one as well. Everybody was saying like, kill your innovation for a second, conserve your cash. But at the same time, I have talked to a lot of people who are saying, well, like I don't have that much else to do right now. I'm not getting good traction on selling on, on my items. So I'm just you know, advancing my innovation pipeline. And then Matt, I'm wondering if maybe you could just jump in on that question too, because 
you guys are sort of coming in at opposite points. Like you guys really prioritized your innovation, obviously to capitalize on immune, but um, I'm assuming that Dean didn't do a whole lot of that uh, with Uncle Matt's brand. Yeah, I mean, they, uh, no, to answer your question, they didn't do a whole <laughs> lot on, on the innovation piece. They did put us into Frozen. So they had um, seven different ice cream plants. And so we worked on some frozen, uh, some popsicles together, um, organic probiotic popsicles, which was a, a fun project. And then, you know, they would give me feedback on new item ideas that we had. Um, but, you know, they were, they were in a different whole category altogether. So it was, it was for us to really push the envelope and innovate and say, hey, I think this is what the customer is demanding in that category. And for us to grow the business, these are some of the things we need to do. And then, you know, they had their own, you know, from regulatory uh, to legal to <laughs> go down the list of, you know, <clears throat> trying to get past uh, each one of those steps before you could get out into the marketplace. Yeah, but and and so in terms of actual COVID period, if we can focus that, just because I know everyone on here is wondering, like, what do I do right now? Yeah. Um, and and I'm, we're in a different phase of COVID than we were last spring, but I think the the question is is still relevant. Are you with Nicole and just really even if for for some of the people in here who are maybe not in five thousand stores, they're in like yeah. 20, 30, 50 stores. Are you sort of on board with that? Just like really buckle down on your data and 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 what you have, uh, camp. Yeah, I mean, uh, one, where's your cash at? You know, how much flexibility do you have as a company to get off of the path that you're on, uh, if that's uh, indeed not a good uh, path? I'm going to assume that you launched a product that you thought were was going to work and it was doing okay uh, in COVID. If you are finding yourself getting discontinued left and right during COVID because um, you're too much of a niche, then you need to innovate and look at, you know, trying to get back towards the center. Uh, and COVID has done that. I mean, it has eliminated some of the outliers. We were lucky with our innovation because it was right focused on immunity, uh, which played into uh, that piece with, with the COVID pandemic. But yeah, I mean, they're, they're shedding other outliers that don't have the velocity because their staples uh, need more space. And, you know, they, they don't have enough shelf space for a lot of the um, basic uh, items that are out there. So yeah. I would say you need to buckle down on what you've got. Uh, and if you're feeling that's getting discontinued and it doesn't have the velocity, then you need to pivot to where the market and the trend is. Um, if you can do that with the cash you have. Yeah. It's a good time to be a, a staple. Um, and, <laughs> and, uh, uh, let me underscore something, Heath, while you uh, ch uh, think through the next question here. Um, you know, I, I fed you uh, a line, Nicole, and you, and you hit it out of the park exactly as I was hoping. You are both excellent storytellers. You're both natural marketers. You both have authentic stories. Yet, uh, beyond mentioning it, Matt, neither of you emphasized it. Nicole, you went right to really what the punchline is, has been for five weeks, which is uh, retailers need to know that you're helping so uh, solve a problem. We had a distributor who talked about the fact that they're still not at anywhere close to 100% customer service fulfillment. Right. And retailers are just trying hard to scramble and reset to the new COVID reality. And so what I want the audience to hear is um, both of these folks went right to data. I can tell you, Matt's, our monthly board meetings with Matt are are you know, three hours of pouring through mm. hard data. Nicole just told you. And this is by way of setting up one, there's a question here that Asher asks, and I'm just curious how you both react to it. Um, they're a small e-com based brand doing about two and a half million dollars in revenue. And they outsource most of their marketing to a small boutique agency. Mm. They're reasonably satisfied with them, but think the ultimate goal is to insource marketing. And the question is, how do we know when it's time to do so? And I, you know, that's a very specific question, but I want to, I'm asking you guys the more generic, how do you know, you know, given your obsession with performance and being sure you're in stock, being sure you're delivering, being sure you know your velocities, how do you know when to invest a bit? How do you know when to spend? How do you know when to rededicate some of your internal resources to marketing and communications? And then we'll go back to some more questions from Ethan, but either of you. 
Well, I would just say historically, we've looked at what our sales reductions are and kind of how the trade's been and slotting and that looks as a total number of uh, either gross, uh, gross sales. You know, our average is probably 15% of gross sales is kind of what we spend on that whole thing. If you're launching a lot of new items, you can spend 20, 25. They'll take, you know, all of it if you wanted to give them 100%. Um, so we kind of try and stay within that bucket. Uh, we are a low margin company though. So we have to be very careful and, and watch every uh, penny. We're still that uh, orange juice commodity uh, specific brand. So we've got to be uh, pretty careful there. But I think, you know, we'll, we'll look uh, if we have uh, more margin to play with. Um, we'll lean in heavier on new items for sure, because we want to make sure they stick. If you're talking about hiring new people, it would be you know, as we uh, basically look at each uh, manager within uh, the company and say, you know, are you getting the goals and objectives that we set for you accomplished? Uh, and, uh, and if you're not and you're constantly struggling, you know, it's our job uh, to react and say, okay, we need to get more help there. Especially if you're, if you're going DTC, I mean, I think everybody probably on this uh, call is going, all right, e-com exploded in 2020 uh, for every retailer. Um, and DTC needs to be some kind of Part of the solution. We just launched on the East Coast. It, um, it's very difficult to do perishable heavy juice uh, and make any money on it uh, until you get to a scale that you hope to get in the future. And so, but it's a part where that's where the consumer's going and we don't want to miss out. So we're going we're gonna to put our toe in the water, continue to learn, get better in that. Uh, we're not going to you know, go overboard and go way out of budget because we don't have those kind of, we're not in the supplements. <laughs> Um, so we just have to be careful as you move forward. But I, I would say um, that's how I would go by that decision. How about you, Nicole? Well, I, I think, you know, one of the things that, I mean, I've always, I mean, I love agencies because they can allow you to do, you know, more with less. Um, but I'm always hesitant as a new brand to outsource too much initially because I feel like that's the most important way to understand, you know, sort of like those three pillars for me, but you know, what is your authentic brand story and how do you tell it and how do people respond to it? So, I mean, like in terms of like bringing it in house, like I guess I feel like that job should almost be in house to start. And then, you know, and then you look to add on to it with agencies. Um, I mean, I feel that way about sales too, you know, I mean, entrepreneurs should always do their own sales and um, at least initially. And, you know, I think marketing is, is, is exactly the same way. I mean, you know, understanding who your brand speaks to and, you know, being able to tell in that authentic message, I, you know, I just, so I guess it's sort of, to, cause I, I actually saw that, I mean, I'm trying not to be super specific, but that specific question was, you know, they're wondering when to bring it in house. And yeah, right. I guess I would have gone the opposite direction. Um, so to answer the question, I would say now, <laughs> but, but I think that, you know, even if that's, you know, you, you know, you, you doing it and finding somebody that can work with you on a part-time basis, then augmenting that with a little bit of an, of an agency work. Yeah. Um, yeah I was going to say that too, at, at, at two and a half, at two and a half million, it, it, that's like the perfect time to be really, I mean, you can get to know your customers almost on a personal basis at, at that size. You know, if you're, if you're selling through your own website, you have their email address, like you have full access to all your customer base. Um, so it does seem like something that, that you can do on your own. Were you gonna ask me something? No, I was just gonna ask, you know, in your case, you're, you're smaller, you're launching, you're innovating. Uh, how, how do you answer that question? Yeah, well, I was, I was actually gonna say the same exact thing as Nicole. I mean, we have like, my whole team is five people and two, two are marketing. So, and, and I'm including D2C and Amazon management in there. So like, di you know, digital and marketing under the same umbrella, but we spend so much time focusing on getting to know our customers where we can. We've seen most of our, and I actually do wanna kind of turn to D2C and Amazon. So this is a good segue because we see most of our growth on Amazon and obviously the one downfall of Amazon is you have limited data, but if you, uh, this uh, Asher, I think it was, didn't really uh, specify if it's website or Amazon, but the huge advantage, if you do have a couple million on your site is, is really getting to know your customer. And there's, there's, it's a gold mine for, for data there. And 
Um, I don't know what your email list looks like, but I'm, I'm assuming that's getting built out pretty well as well, as well and, and social. So yeah, I would have uh, said the same thing uh, as Nicole, but if I can just take that question a bit further, cause I know there's a, half yeah. the questions in here are about DTC and Amazon. Um, I know this is a hot topic for, for Matt and, and we touched on it with Nicole earlier, but um, I, I, Trevor's always in here asking good questions. Uh, he said, many additional brands entered the e-commerce space during the last 12 months. And what, what is or what was your specific determination point for entering the space? And where have you gained knowledge so far in that space being newer? And I just, I, yeah. I, I mean, I think that's a, yeah, that's a perfect, perfect question for a lot of people in here is like, are you just entering the space because you have to be there? Um, is there a certain kind of like margin or product that you, that, that is looking better to you in the early stage? Yeah. So a uh, great question from Trevor and, you know, we entered the space one because the consumers go in there. And so you kind of always want to meet your consumer where they're at. And so if they're shopping online, uh, I don't want to lose that, that customer to some other uh, competition. Um, we haven't figured out the widget yet to make it a profitable uh, you know, opportunity, but I believe it takes time and we'll build it uh, from that standpoint. And I think we'll eventually get there and it may not be the product mix we have now, uh, but we're obviously looking at other innovative ideas that do better on direct to consumer uh, platforms with our brand. And so, you know, you're probably not going to have a lot of success with just selling 52 ounce pulp free orange juice. that has got to get there, you know, in, in two days because it has to stay chilled. Um, that's probably not going to be the winner if that's your business plan. So you got to, you know, I, I think because the market has shifted so much to DTC, um, we owe it to ourselves to try and put some effort into it to see if we can find, you know, a piece of that um, uh, for Uncle Matt's and that market share. And can I just push a little bit further? I mean, is there yeah. a point where, uh, you, so you're in discovery phase right now, uh, yep. is there a point or a process in which you'll say, all right, forget this or we, or forget this product or yep. how, how are you going to think about evaluating that? So we're, we'll give it a year. I mean, we're going to give it 2021 just to see, Hey, how does this, uh, can we, um, you know, operate well with our existing line? What do we learn? I mean, I, I gotta say, I love the fact, uh, we're not on Amazon yet. We'll eventually get there. We, we don't have the margins to really hop on Amazon. That gets really ugly. Um, <laughs> so we're playing with our DTC for now on our, our own site. Uh, I do love the fact that I don't get a no if I want to launch a new item in my own store. Uh, I got plenty of shelf space, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I do like that. And I can have a direct relationship with anybody uh, out there from a customer standpoint. I don't have any people in between me, whether it's a distributor uh, or another retailer. Uh, I love that. Uh, that's very intriguing for me from a guy that's been on the other side for 20 years going through review cycles and, you know, there's only so much room in the refrigerated juice set and, you know, somebody's got to go out for you to go in and you're just kind of, you know, <laughs> it's a slow grind. Um, I love the fact that DTC, I can launch something today if I wanted to uh, on my website and nobody can stop me. Yeah. And uh, Nicole, anything in terms of just early learnings? Yeah. I mean, you know, again, even you have like the perfect product for direct to consumer, but um, cause it's like, you know, small and, price right for it. But yeah. um, having said that, we're not in the perfect category. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're not that, it, we're pretty reasonably priced and we're very heavy um, and awkwardly shaped um, when you're talking about a case or even an eight pack. So, um, and we also have a really small team. So we knew we probably couldn't do both great. You know, we couldn't support our retailers and support a DTC launch at the same time. So ultimately what we decided to do was to part to, to go with the Amazon route because um, that you know, doesn't require the effort in terms of manpower from an internal team standpoint that DTC requires. And we could learn so much um, about the best ways to ship and you know, what sells and what people like. Um, so that's what we decided to do. And we launched on Amazon you know, this past summer and you know, we actually started um, because you know we we used to do direct to consumer at, at Rage July, and it was you know it was a kind of a nightmare, honestly. Um, but for the opposite problem, we were very large <laughs> boxes. Um, so we started with two SKUs because we didn't want to make you know the same mistake 
seven times. <laughs> we figured we'd make it just twice. twice. Yeah. And then course correct and then launch new ones. Um, you know, test out our pages, test out our keywords, test out what's working, what's not. Um, so we launched with two and now, you know, so many months later, we have all of our SKUs on Amazon, but it, you know, we did it, we did a very slow rollout and, um, we like kind of learned as we went and I'm very pleased. I mean, it's never going to be a real profitable channel for us because of how heavy our product is, unfortunately. Mm. Um, but I do think it's worth it because for all the same reasons Matt just mentioned, I mean, we can launch new innovation on Amazon, we can test things, we can test multi-packs, we can, you know, there's there's a variety of things that we can do, even though it's not our own website, it still give up, gives us the same learnings. Yeah, and I'll just add quickly, and Dad, I don't know if you want to get to any of these other questions, yeah. but for, okay. for us, it's it's been... Uh, I wasn't that calculated about it as, as you were, we just kind of launched and tried both channels and just found much better results on Amazon. Um, and, and really now people say a lot of times your margin is better on your site. I mean, you have to offer free shipping on your site now. Like if you're not, you're, I mean, depends on your product, I suppose, but you pretty much have to. So at that point, our margins on Amazon and, and our site were roughly the same. So it was, it was a complete no brainer. So that was my yeah. big, big learning. So I got a couple very specific questions we'll try to knock off here. Um, Matt, uh, well, actually maybe both of you, but certainly Matt, how has the rise of premium private label organic been a challenger? Yeah, you know, you can look at it two ways. Um, the rising tide raises all boats. It brings more people to the category, right? And so you're gonna have people that are, um, you know, always private label shoppers and then the other uh, group that wants a, a branded item and, and a premium offering. So. You know, yeah, it makes it a little bit more difficult um, to expand your uh, item base because there is only so much room in the set. Uh, but at the same time, I see it as a positive. It's going to bring more eyeballs uh, if people are doing a private label organic juice uh, to that space. And we're typically the brand that goes next to private label. Yeah. But it, it is a challenge from a price point standpoint. They're always going to be cheaper. They're always going to, uh, you know, get the, the right shelf space. Uh, so you just yeah. have to deal with it. It's part of life now. And it's growing in every category. Mm -hmm. um, Nicole, uh, you tempted, uh, I'm sure everyone had this question. You, you alluded to the early mistakes and mistakes and mistakes. Can you summarize a couple for folks? Oh, do we have a whole webinar on those? Or <laughs> just, just the next few <laughs> yeah. Mm. Well, I would say, I mean, there's two that come immediately to mind. I mean, one of the worst mistakes we made, and we made it like, almost immediately. So luckily we got it out of the way. Um, but we launched, so we launched um, actually an Expo East of our first year, which like on shelves was 2003. And like almost right away, our three crackers that we launched with, I mean, we're killing it. I mean, we were all across the country because no one had really done, I mean, I think I was so like the PTSD from my mom's like 1970s health food store sort of, you know, powered me to launch these like Know, kind of conventional tasting products for the set of the store that really hadn't seen a ton of innovation. Um, and so they really took off. Um, we were really struggling with um, cheese supply and a bunch of other, because we were one of the only people in the country using certified organic cheese that needed to be dried. Mm -hmm. So like we were it really. Um, a, another brand launched after us that Kind of hurt the supply, I guess, helped ultimately grow the it. But so we decided we needed to change our pack size. And we didn't, I mean, now I know this is one of those things that you kind of learn as you go, but we did not need to change our UPC code. Uh -huh. But we were given the advice that we probably should um, because we were within the threshold that you didn't need to. So we changed our UPC code on our number one selling item. Mm. And it was also number one in the category at the time. Oh, yeah. Ouch. And um, I cannot emphasize, I mean, everyone I see, Ethan, you're like laughing at me. Matt's providing I'm, some good I'm color. I'm bearing my soul here to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> but I cannot emphasize enough. Don't ever let someone convince you you need to change your UPC code without checking with at least a thousand more people on that one. Right. I mean, that will kill your product faster than you can. Yeah. I mean, I, I promise you that will be have the opposite effect that you're hoping it has. Mm. Um, if you ever get debt, 
get key man insurance. That mm -hmm. is a yeah. critically important early mistake that I made that I will never do again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think one of the other big mistakes that I made that's probably something that, um, you know, took me a while to kind of come to terms with was I was always really afraid to do my own selling because I was not comfortable. I mean, despite what maybe everyone on this call thinks, like I'm not the most extroverted person in every situation. <laughs> and, you know, selling really felt like I was putting myself out there in a way that wasn't immediately comfortable for me. Um, and so I, I kind of resisted that. And then after my father passed away, it was something that I took over. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when it's your brand and you're the most passionate person, nobody can understand your brand better than you. And I, you know, I just, I really wish that I'd started out doing my own sales. I think that that was one of the biggest early mistakes I made because there was so much about kind of how my brand was selling. I didn't understand uh, closely enough. And until you're right there sitting next, you know, in front of a buyer, you're, you just, you, no one can communicate that to you in the way that, you know, when you're directly there experiencing it. And there's le at least a thousand more examples, but those are probably the first three that, um, come to mind actually uh, along those lines um matt just asked a, uh, an important question i think for those who are actually still focused on selling into retail um i'm reading this in my head in your aussie accent matt um he said interested to know how nicole and matt are thinking about in-store merchandising at this time with foot traffic down and brands feeling pressure on margins is it worth it or with the need to ensure you are on shelf and making every retail account is it more important than ever so that's for both of both of yeah. us. Um, you know, it depends on the category and how well um, you believe the store uh, sticks to a planogram, right? So if the store is uh, very good at planograms, like a Publix, um, it's not as needed, at least in uh, the refrigerated case where I'm at. Uh, if you're in the grab and go cooler, it's hand to hand combat sometimes, right? And so. Uh, merchandisers, in-store merchandisers can really help with uh, single serve stuff that you're trying to put in the front cooler and DSD guys come around, you know, every couple days and rearrange the thing. So uh, it really kind of just depends on the product you've got and the goals uh, of where you want to be in the store and how well those stores uh, follow planograms or allow the in-store merchandisers to make some changes. We've used them um, when we first got Uncle Matt's back. We, we did a great 90-day uh, period just to kind of refresh the stores. Uh, it was, you know, coming out of COVID. Um, I think the traffic is coming uh, back. And so, you know, it just depends on your category and what your goals are. They are, you know, fairly pricey. Those in-store merchandisers can be pricey, but if, uh, they can also really help you as a startup brand, if you can afford them uh, and you're in that category that is kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat daily. <laughs> I mean, I definitely wanted to, to speak to Alan too, because I think that Matt really mentioned um, an important distinction there and not, you know, what category are you in? And I know Matt, who's, who's asking the question, is in snacks. Because um, mm. I've memorized all of the, um, <laughs> the participants in their companies. <laughs> no, but I just happen to know he was there. And, you know, being in um, sparkling water and beverage, I mean, you need to be merchandising your it, it, like it's absolutely mission critical right now that you have some merchandising your product. And if you can't afford to do it everywhere, pick a market and make a case. Um, and the reason why it's also important is because you're most likely gonna have to be, if you're in a category that eventually you're gonna need to go DSD, um, you better build in the cost of that into your model to begin with. So that means that you know, because when, when you're DSD, you don't also need merchandisers. So but regardless, you're going to be paying, you know, a certain percentage for that in-store piece. So planning for it earlier on and being prepared for it, knowing it in your costs. Um, but right now, I mean, I, if, if we weren't, we're using merchandisers and um, it's made a, an enormous amount of difference because mm. we, we're trying to, but you're, you know, you have to be respectful of retail rules right now and knowing what you can do. Um, and just working with people that the retailers are already comfortable with and are already allowed in stores and that, that they know um, is important. Yeah. Hey, um, there's a couple questions about production. I'm going to ask you both, notably how you get co-packers in just a second. But I just want to comment 
John Rulak put something in the chat to us panelists that um, he was just chatting with a leader at Thrive Market and we'll have Thrive on with us in uh, two weeks. Uh, they have 1.1 million customers. They're growing very fast. Unlike Amazon, they can create amazing digital content, build brand awareness, and they're suggesting that brands give Thrive an exclusive for X amount of days on a SKU mm -hmm. or whatever. So I just, people should understand Amazon's not the only game in town. Um, a question being asked, uh, how do you all, I mean, Matt, this is a little less relevant for you, although becoming relevant, but just how do you become important enough as small brands to uh, negotiate your way into co-packers? Sure. Hey, real quick on the Thrive piece, they don't do perishable yet. We wish they would. They said it's right. probably a couple years off, uh, but yes, sure. absolutely. Thrive is an excellent option for others. Um, the question, uh, you know, how do you become relevant to a co-packer if you're small? Is that really, you know? Yeah, and how do you get in there? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, you just got to keep search. You got to keep searching to find the right one that you can work with, because that can also be a, a real death blow in the beginning if their minimums are too high, right? And you go in and you spend most of your money on a production run that has X amount of lifespan, whether perishable. I mean, everything is perishable to some degree, um, and you've got huge amounts of inventory. Uh, I mean, that's a tough, that's a tough game. So you just, you know, there's, um, there's the PLMA, Private Label Manufacturers Association. You can uh, search through their um, uh, database to see, you know, can you find two, three or four co-packers to try and, you know, get to compete for your business and, and meet your metrics. I mean, you really want to go in and try and get as low minimums as possible. Uh, so you have as little risk as possible because you're going to fail. You're going to fail on some items that just totally whiffed and you thought they were the greatest thing. It tasted great. And, you know, everybody told you, all your friends are like, you're the smartest guy in the room and you're not. Uh, they were just wanting to be your friend and they should have told you candidly, like, that's a dumb idea and the, that product stinks. Uh, and you're going to fail when you put it out. So make sure your minimums, uh, you again, cash is king and you don't uh, do too much, but you need to, you need to try and find as many co-packers as you can for backup. Uh, when you have a pandemic, uh, those things change too. So you try to be too deep on co-packers and suppliers. Uh, that's one thing we learned from the pandemic uh, and just good business practice, period. Nicole? Sure. I, I want to echo the two statements about Thrive Market. I mean, similarly to Matt, they don't do a ton with canned beverages because of the how heavy they are, but they were an amazing partner to us at late July and their mission and everything they're doing, it's just really to be applauded. So I definitely, if you have a product that is something that they're open to selling, I cannot um, endorse them enough. <laughs> but um, as far as co-packers go, I think this is where Gary's messaging about storytelling really becomes important because, you know, if you're a small, both with late July and with Mixie, you know, we had to convince really large factories to work with us. For, and, and honestly, there was no reason why they should say yes. Um, you know, so you're, it's really you convincing them. I mean, there's not like a magic to it other than, you know, you're trying to make a case for why they should take a chance on a brand that doesn't even exist yet and um, give up line time that they could give to somebody else for you. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's really that kind of the storytelling and, and knowing why your brand needs to exist and convincing co-packers and you know you're probably going to have to try a lot of co-packers before you get somebody to say yes um and don't be discouraged about that that's you know it happens to everybody um you know i mean it's, that's very normal and, and honestly gary so back to the uh nicole's part about sales if you're the founder you need to brush up on your sales skill because you got to sell everybody along the entire channel yeah from your investors to your co-packer to your suppliers, uh, to the distributor retail, all the whole lineup in the beginning, you know, everybody is going to doubt you and they don't know you. And so you, you need to be really good at storytelling and sales and uh, follow up, uh, be diligent uh, and be prepared. And, you know, you're going to get plenty of no's. Don't take it personal. Matt, um, before I go to Ethan, uh, somebody's just clarifying, what was the name of that private label association? So PLMA, Private Label Manufacturers Association, they have a, a trade show annually. I think it's in Chicago every year. Thanks. Mm -hmm. This is my, my time. When, yes. when are we actually done here? We have about 10 minutes. Well, we have about eight minutes. 
Okay. Uh, all right. There's a question in here from Christopher that I just think needs to be touched on quickly because I keep seeing it pop up. Um, he said, Ethan and Nicole, what did you do for initial brand design? Where was it in terms of priority? Or, oh, that question just disappeared. Uh, oh, where, where was it in priority in terms of capital allocation? I think it was. Did you just get rid of that while I was reading it? Sorry. Yes, I was answering it. Wow. That was, um, <laughs> So I, I just, I was just having this conversation with somebody. I, I uh, and Nicole, I don't know, feel free to jump in on any of this. I just, obviously design is super critical at the beginning and getting your brand right. Uh, I, we, I didn't spend any money on it at the beginning and we needed a ton of improvement and we've improved it along the way. And I think that that is probably one of the first things I would cut when I'm looking at people's initial budgets uh, out of the gate. And I know it's like, it's a chicken or the egg thing too, because you want to get it right, or at least somewhat right. But that's one of those things where if you do enough legwork and enough sourcing of, of opinions of, of people in your life, I mean, the general, like the person walking on the sidewalk can give you as good an opinion on your packaging as almost anybody, because that's who you're selling to. So I just think there's a lot of work you can do at the beginning to do that. And I hope, I'm hoping like Blake and some other people are not on here. Cause I was just going to say like <laughs> the agencies will gouge you. And like, sometimes, you know, maybe you spend 50 K on a brand design, but then they'll charge you another 50 K to put it on your different kinds of packaging. Like there are a lot of places to save money. And I would be really careful uh, about that one in the early stages. Nicole. I mean, I, I think I come at it from a slightly different perspective. I mean, like when you don't have a lot of money, the only thing you control is what people see on the store shelf. You know, and like I, you know, I'm not doing advertising. I can't, you know, it's hard to reach people. I mean, social media is obviously amazing, but, you know, I, I thought, you know, investing in our packaging and making sure that, you know, everything was right and that my photography was the way I wanted it. And, you know, even at late July, I mean, I think I spent like, can't even remember exactly. I mean, honestly, I think the, 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 when you're first starting like with late July, anyway, you know, in my mind, it was like a million dollars, but I'm sure it was like $2,000 you know, at the time. Yeah. But, um, you know, we hired somebody that was way out of our league um, in terms of package design, but she wasn't fancy, you know what I mean? She, but she like hand lettered our logo. She, you know, there was stuff I wanted that made it kind of look the way I wanted it to look. So you do have to be careful and you don't have to use expensive designers for everything because like, you know, you can use freelancers for, you know, parts of it and you can, you know, fill in the gaps. But I think that, you know, making sure that your package design is the way that does tell your story, um, you know, I don't know. To me, that was a really important thing to spend money on. Yeah, no. So a woman, oh. sorry, but uh, one woman asked a very specific question of you, Nicole, where uh, do you do your images in house? She's saying they really shine on Amazon. Some of them we do, and some of them, like we're actually renderings that our designers did for us. Um, but a lot of the pictures are pictures that we take, like that we use on social media. And um, we're working on actually adding some video <laughs> to our, um, and we've hired an agency to help us with that. Well, that's a, that's a good question. And kind of along the lines of what we were just talking about, because I think I, I would told, I would agree that investing it early in content has been like, that was one thing that I cheaped on. Oh, I cheap on everything, but that was one thing of many. Uh, and, and that was, that was one where we really had to catch up. Like I was like, oh, our content is, is bad and improving your content, especially online and, and on Amazon makes a huge difference. So that's one where, where I think the investment is definitely worth it. Yeah, back to that original question on whether you bring that person inside or you still outsource yeah. it. I, I still think, you know, in the beginning, you try to be as lean and mean as you can. And, and if that is your expertise, if you really believe like we've got somebody that can do it, um, you know, and do it well, then hire that person. I mean, an agency has a lot of eyeballs to look at it, uh, but they can be very pricey. So you just kind of need to shop. You need to, you know, convince them that you don't have any money for even uh, food today. So they got to keep it really low on the price uh, to get an admission. But I was very fortunate from my standpoint. I married my uh, photographer, designer, and um, uh, web. Yeah, designer. good strategy. I good was strategy. very fortunate from that standpoint. She was very yeah. talented. My wife is very talented. So. <laughs> but I have to clarify too that we don't we don't bring package design in house. 
Right. But we do bring other, we bring all, our, all of our marketing is done in-house. So yeah. everything but package to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's many more questions than we have time for here. Uh, so I'm going to say two things and ask you both to respond. Um, one's very specific. They're just asking for some guidance on discovery. Is it important to be a sponsor at events? You know, you're both mission driven. You're both cause related. Is that an important uh, in the early going? But the the broader uh, question I want to ask is, um, you know, uh, uh, Nicole you're now a beverage person, uh, despite my best attempt to talk you out of it, Matt, you obviously are. Um, there's a lot of beverage people listening right now. Uh, if you have any general comments about competitiveness in your space, and if there's like, you know, a key thing you've just got to do, and of course you've talked about, well, by the way, Ethan, you're a beverage company too, so you should answer this as well. Um, but you know, you've talked about understanding your sales and your velocities. That point really clearly made. You've talked about keeping it lean, focusing on that end user, being sure your shelves are stocked. Uh, you know, the high cost of distribution. You've just got to really succeed where you are. But um, folks are asking. Uh, well, I mean, one question asked of you, Nicole, is: Is it harder to be in beverage versus late July? You might touch on that. But you know, any any hard hitting. A council before we wrap up here uh, for people brave enough to join you in the beverage space. Well, I guess one of the things I would say is that any category we're being in is competitive. I mean, you know, it's like, I think that it's, you know, although my father did have a crouton company at one point and, you know, you, you can, you, but, but the thing is when you go into small categories, you have to be like basically a hundred percent of a small category to be a viable brand. Now, you know, beverage, you know, carbonated beverages are $30 billion category, which is still dominated right now by Coke, Coke, by soda. And if you look at the trends, you know, soda and unhealthier beverages are going down while, you know, healthier beverages, particularly sparkling water are rising at an astronomical rate, mm -hmm. but they're a tiny part of that three thirty $30 billion category. So it's incredibly competitive, but I think what we're gonna see over the next decade is every one of the supermarket aisles is gonna you know, ha have this transformation where we're gonna see you know, less unhealthy products and more healthier products. Um, so you, you know, maybe that pie is gonna grow or stay similar. So it'll go from, you know, it's gonna grow obviously because we're growing as a society, but you know, a portion of that that is um, healthier beverages like sparkling water or organic juice is gonna take up a, a you know, a Increasing. larger percentage of an enormous yep. category. Yep. And so I never let, I mean, my entire career has been being a challenger in competitive categories. I mean, you know, first I ran marketing at Cape Cod Potato Chips for my father and I launched a reduced fat product at the same time that, you know, this world changing Alestra product hit the markets, which I don't know if anybody remembers that, but everyone said, you know, it was going to be a category killer. And, um, you know, and it, so it's, it's just, you're always going to have competition and that's where it's important to just make sure your product has a reason to exist yep. and that you can tell the compelling story behind it. Yeah. And to answer the question, snacks and beverages, I have not noticed it being, I think all hard categories are hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Matt? Yeah, so uh, I would say, you know, beverage is great because uh, there's a lot of innovation that is allowed to come in the category. It doesn't need to stay stale, especially in the grab and go space. Um, so I kind of always laugh as I, um, my number one skew is just pulp free organic orange juice. Um, but you look at the example like Hanson Juice, right? They had their monster moment. Uh, they were just a little juice company and then they launched Monster and they were in that beverage space. They knew the beverage space and it just went you know, gangbusters. And here they are today. It's, you know, monsters, you know, you don't even think about Hanson Juice Company anymore. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, that's the great thing about beverage. Uh, yes, it's really tough. Uh, every buyer will tell you, this is a competitive space, no matter what category you're in. We don't make any more, you know, the, the store isn't expanding. So, you know, we've got to cut and all that. So you just got to uh, have something that is unique. You know, don't be a me too. If you're a, an early uh, brand starting out, and you're looking around and you think, I just kind of want to be a me too with a little tiny add-on, uh, that's not going to work very well. You're going to spend a lot of money, a lot of time getting 
getting there. So, you know, the market, the great thing is the market will reward a uh, unique novel innovation and they'll reward it pretty quick. Yeah. Um, because they're, they're willing to put in new stuff because the, the velocity in beverages is, is pretty good. Um, yeah. It's not something you buy and you, you hold on for 12 months as you use that whole bucket of whatever it is. Um, I mean, you go back to that store regularly. So that's what makes it fun. But at the same time, you also got to be on top of your game because everybody's shooting for you. You know, yes. you can't just sit still and say, oh, I'm, you know, we're going to sell this one widget for the rest of our lives. Ethan, final word from you as someone rolling out in a tough, tough well, category. Matt, Matt isn't going to want to hear this, but I was just going to say be shelf stable. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. There's plenty of market for that. Yeah. Well, actually, Matt is kind of listening to that a little. <laughs> Um, I'm always listening to innovation. Yeah. Listen, you guys, uh, so many wonderful lessons here and so much learning. And, you know, you're celebrating, of course, the HEI tradition, which is we learn best through storytelling, through experience, through those mistakes that we, you know, it, it's always, it's never about avoiding mistakes. It's about getting back up after, right? And I'm looking at three examples, four examples on the screen of people who bounced back many, many times. Um, I want to, uh, Carlene, if you put up the last slide, I want to just remind everybody this uh, recording, this session has been recorded. There's a lot of content here. Uh, you'll be able to find, um, uh, come back, uh, look at the recording. You'll be able to see some of the links uh, in the chat. Um, these are our next four webinars. As I mentioned, there are some more coming. Uh, I can tell you right now, we have some large independent uh, natural food uh, 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 groups who are going to be uh, retailers who are going to be coming to talk to us and um, we are uh, there's more more to come I also want to remind you how we began um, if you have a product or service a number of you have been using the chat very well to uh, promote yourselves if you have a product or service that you think could benefit this community uh, go on our website fill out the application uh, get it in by Friday for the following Wednesday we will let you know by Monday if you've been selected and do your five minute pitch. And as ever, send us your feedback. Um, uh, we welcome it, we need it. Uh, content, topics, anything you'd like to see more of, less of, what have you. And finally, uh, we do have our Entrepreneurship Institute coming in early May. Uh, all of these wonderful presenters today have been active parts of uh, HEI. That's your chance to be a real case in front of people like uh, Nicole and Ethan and Matt. Uh, and get a chance for some real hard feedback. And of course, the third day is all about pitching. Um, Matt, you mentioned it, uh, I forgot, so thank you. Uh, we wanna thank New Hope Network for having been a sponsor and partner here. And uh, it's um, uh, important uh, as, as uh, we obviously will not have an expo this spring, pay close attention to the incredible offerings uh, at New Hope, especially coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, with that, Nicole, thank you for, as ever, uh, your wisdom, your humor, your optimism, uh, your uh, encouragement. Matt, you are a, a rock star as well. Uh, it's um, not easy being in perishable commodity. It's, you know, Nicole ignored my advice. There we go. Uh, and, 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 and you ignored the advice as well. You bought, <laughs> you bought back your... Your company and you're in the soup. And, and Ethan, of course, uh, as ever, we really appreciate your perspective as an earlier uh, version of all of us old people. I'll, I'll speak for myself there. Um, thank uh, you. I had a company before COVID, unlike these guys. So well, that's true. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, thank you all. Once again, we will see you next week and uh, stay safe, everybody. Bye bye. bye guys. Thank you. Bye.